So please, next time, <laughs> try and keep the mobile phones uh, turned off or in whatever mode. <laughs> you know that I don't have a mobile phone, which causes me a lot of difficulty sometimes. You know, because sometimes people say, well, just, uh, we can send any alerts on the mobile phone. I say, no, you can't. I don't have one. It's very f good fun being a monk. There's so many things I don't have. I know I told this story before, but it just runs in from what I was just saying. A few years ago, I decided to get myself a Commonwealth Seniors Healthcare Card. <laughs> That's right, yeah. Only reason why, not because I needed it, I don't get sick, but nevertheless I thought, well, it's allowed. Why can't I get one? So I thought you can get one online. So I went into one of the monastery computers, you know, managed to get through, and they said, no, you can't get these things online because there's something in Australia, many places in the Western world, called identity fraud. I need to go into one of the government office to prove who I was. So I had to make an appointment. I <laughs> Good exercise for you. Well done. <laughs> so anyway, so I went into the the local is it Centrelink office? Is that right? Okay, yeah, okay, yeah. Centrelink office and there was a lady that made the appointment and there went and then when we sat down, she said, now listen, you know, can you prove who you are? And you know my character. I said to her, for almost to that time, 45 years I've been trying to find out who I am. <laughs> That's why I'm a Buddhist monk. <laughs> now you laugh, she didn't. <laughs> she scowled, look, this is serious. So I said, I will need some ID. So can I see your driver's license? Exactly, I don't have a driver's license. Okay. Your credit card. I don't have a credit card. Bank account he does. I don't have bank accounts. Uh, your, um, the, what was it, the next thing she asked? The house where you live, your owner's certificate. I don't own a house. All I live is in a little cave in Serpentine. So, well, your rental agreement, I don't rent that. I don't have a rental agreement. <laughs> and then the next thing they ask for, your marriage license or marriage agreement. Say, I'm not married, I'm single, I'm a monk. And then they said to me, these are the, almost, the usual things they ask to prove your identity. So I don't have those. You know what this lady said after? He said, well, look, according to the government of Australia, you don't exist. <laughs> and I said, Sada, Sada, the Buddha was right. <laughs> I don't exist. <laughs> but anyway, I did have a passport. and said, okay, we can take that. So it did give me the card in the end. But you know, so how strange it is when you do things differently, when you don't have like a mobile phone. Actually, no one has a mobile phone. The mobile phones have you. They own you. That's when they start ringing. It's like a little kid. Ah, 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 mommy, 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 I need your attention. <laughs> have you ever noticed your mobile phones? At least the last time I saw one in the old days, they, they have these, what they're not actually, we weren't called mobile phones in those days, they were called cell phones. What does cell remind you of? Prison. You're in a prison if you have a cell phone. And to prove that, when you turn it on, you see all the bars. <laughs> I got five bars as a good signal. It doesn't mean the signal means you can't escape. <laughs> you're stuck, you're in jail. <laughs> So anyway, it's nice being a monk that you don't need those mobile phones. I still have an internet, they can do 
emails. I prefer emails. It's, you know, it's pretty old-fashioned these days, but at least you can answer them whenever you want to, rather than always controlling you. So anyway, that's just a little thing about our world. One of the things about being a monk, you can question things, you can do things differently. And when you do things differently, why? Because it's much more comfortable. Now, even little things. And I said that I don't own anything, literally. I don't own this place. You know, if I owned the Dhammaloka Buddhist Center, I would do things much different. <laughs> but it's good enough. That's one of my other subjects. You can find out everything which is wrong with this place. You know, once I remember this uh, meditation center in Barrie, Massachusetts, one of the first uh, places where you can do meditation retreats. And they put a lot of money into that. And then one day they decided, you know, what more can we do? Let's put in like a suggestions box. Now we don't have suggestion boxes here, thank goodness. <laughs> because the suggestion box filled up within an hour. <laughs> and they thought they'd done so, because it's easy, the closer you get to perfection, the more uh, faults you find. You're so close to perfection, so close to being perfect. And that makes people very aware of the faults. Do you understand that? Like Australia, I mean, it's a pretty good country, isn't it? West Australia in particular. Damaloka Buddhist Centre, I mean, wow. How can you find fault with this? You don't have to pay any money to go in, you don't have to pay any money to go out. I thought of that once. Why don't, you know, to get more people to come in. So we say, no entry fee. But anyone who wants to go out has to pay a couple of dollars. And the later you go, the more you have to pay to get out. <laughs> All these crazy schemes of making money, nothing works, but we don't need that. We just, just, um, div just rely on people's kindness. That's even more important. You know, when people just say, decide they want to do something, they want to help, they want to serve, they want to be a volunteer, not because you make them or you pay them, it's because they, they feel they want to do that. And many of the most beautiful things I've seen in life is when nothing was forced. And just, you know, my own life as a lay Buddhist. The reason I talk about myself is because I can trust myself. These things actually happened. I just remember just uh, this, uh, she was a nun. And she came to our Buddhist center in Cambridge once and gave a talk. It wasn't much about Buddhism, it was just about the kindness which she was uh, doing with this orphanage over in Sikkim somewhere. About, you know, these girls who were orphans and that she was trying to look after them and serve them, just acts of compassion and kindness. And I was so moved by what she did that I went to my bank the next day and took, I think, 20 pounds out of my account. Now, 20 pounds may not feel much to you, but that was two weeks' food money for me as a student. You know, my father had already died, my mother was poor, and I was just going on scholarships. But you know, that 20 pounds, which I took out of the bank and just got the check and gave it to this nun, I've never, ever forgotten that. I went hungry, but I cared for somebody. And that just was beautiful to be able to do. I only say that now because it's just those beautiful, kind things which people do just give you so much joy and happiness in life. So this is one of the reasons why the, well, just with, you know, what I really wanted to talk about today was um, on Sunday I will be going overseas again to Sri Lanka. And while I'm away, on the 25th of May, I checked in my an old uh, passport, 25th of May, 40 years ago, that I landed in Perth to actually to serve the Buddhist Society of Western Australia. So I've been working for you non-stop for 40 years. Now look what you've done. If you look at photographs of me 40 years ago, 
I was thin, young, fit, handsome. <laughs> now the way you die. So I'm going to miss that sort of uh, anniversary. But the other thing, which I was talking with Venerable Dayalu earlier, in those 40 years, and how many talks have I given here? How many meditation retreats? How many meditation days? And it's not just here, in just other parts of Perth, overseas. I've given so many talks. Why do you keep on coming? I must be a very bad teacher if you have to keep coming back to the lesson again and again and again and again. You never graduate. <laughs> so why? Because what you hear here is not information. Information you can get from a book. It's more convenient from a book. The information is there, it's embedded in the talk, but it's much more than that. It's just the emotions which come from that information. It's just the ability you know, to give you a talk and have all sorts of jokes and silly stories, but the kindness and the peace which comes with that as well to try and get you to feel you know, what Buddhism is, what meditation is, what kindness is. Not to try and convince you of it, but actually to feel it. And that's one of the most beautiful parts about this path. That's why you can give talk after talk after talk, and people start to feel something really important, something beautiful. And when they feel that beauty, you know, of what peace is. It's too hard to describe what peace is. But to be able to feel it, feel it in your, your bones and in your, your, uh, your marrow, in your muscles and in your heart and even in your toes. It's actually to feel it there, what it's like and get that great emotional wisdom of you know, just what peace and freedom really is. And once you feel that and start valuing it, all these other things which we do in life, the kindness, the forgiveness, the virtue, the peace, the stillness, it becomes quite obvious and quite easy. Sometimes we have so many theories, so many descriptions, if you don't actually know what they're describing, it's like reading some sort of poet describe, say, Paris. But you've never been there. How can you describe the smells of Paris? The mood, the atmosphere, just the things which are invisible, if you ever manage to get there. If you've never been there, how would you ever know? That's one of the interesting things about the sensitivity which we build up, you know, in this spiritual path. That sensitivity can be amazing. And I've often mentioned this to people, and it's no secret. There are some parts of this world, some parts of Perth, which are just so easy to meditate in. And I've mentioned to you before, one of those places is in our main hall in Bodhinyana Monastery. That's one of the strongest. If you go into that hall, people who never managed to do much meditation before in their lives, they go in there and they get very peaceful. A good example of that, a story from a long time ago, that over in Bodhinyana Monastery where I live, there's no scheme water, no water from are supplied by the government. We have to catch our own water, mostly rain water. And so in order to store that water, many years ago, we hired one of these guys to build these big 30,000 gallon concrete tanks. I was amazed by just this one guy did all of that. You know, made one tank in a couple of days. And he was worked so, so hard. And that when he was finished, you know, the concrete tanks are just maybe, maybe 100 meters from my main hall. When he was finished, he asked me, Bram, what he called me, I get called all sorts of interesting names. 
Brahm, one of the most interesting names, is there any people who know Mercedes School in Perth? Have you been there? Any sort of graduates? Okay, but anyway, I gave a talk in that school many years ago, and the next day I just happened by chance to be walking in St. George's Terrace, and there we saw these um, uh, group of schoolgirls, and they recognized me. They said, oh, you gave a talk at our school yesterday. I said, wow, I'm really so sort of honored. Do you remember me? He said, we'll never forget you. Ah, isn't that cute? How can you ever forget a monk called Ajahn Bra? <laughs> There's an M on the end. <laughs> so I always remember Mercedes schoolgirls for that. <laughs> but actually, the, I did mention St. George's Terrace. So somebody reminded me of a story about the two carrots. I haven't told this story for such a long time. There were these two carrots. They were walking down St. George's Terrace. And then one of them got hit by a car driven by a drunk driver. It was really badly injured, this carrot. And so his friend called an ambulance when the ambulance came, they took one look, the medics took one look at the carrot, said, this is really serious, we have to take him to, to I think at that time, Royal Perth Hospital. So they took the carrot, you know, speeding through the red lights, da 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 sirens wailing to Royal Perth Hospital. And when they got the carrot to Royal Perth Hospital, the triage nurses really carefully looked at him and said, this is serious, life and death, it needs immediate surgery. So straight into the operating room, a top doctor came and they did this operation for about th two or three hours. And after finishing the operation, the doctor came into the waiting room. And he saw this, there's only one carrot in the waiting room, he said, you must be the, uh, the friend of the injured carrot. Yeah, that's me, how is it, what's happened? And if you've been in these waiting rooms, it's just so much tension in there. And the doctor said, look, I've got some good news and bad news for you. Your friend, Mr. Carrot, he's going to survive. We managed to keep him alive, so he'll be fine. The only problem is, because of his injuries, he's going to be a vegetable for the rest of his life. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, oh dear, I think that's <laughs> the right result. I don't know, I told that, I just, every time I tell that joke, there's no way I can't laugh <laughs> at my own joke. <laughs> that's such a stupid joke. <laughs> anyway, let's get back to, <laughs> where was I? Uh, emotional intelligence, yeah, and just the emotions. Look, how do you feel when you laugh? You know, there's a feeling of there of joy and peace. It's a very healthy feeling for laughter. So just even coming here and allowing yourself to laugh at something silly, it just changes a lot of the way you look at life. And there are sometimes I've asked people just, did you like the talk this evening? And they said, yeah, it was a good talk. What did you remember? Two carrots. <laughs> But it's more than that. Once you get the happiness and the peace and the joy, how does it feel? Your mindfulness just unlocks the wisdom of that joy and that happiness. So you can actually feel it. How does it feel when you get upset and angry? That's really such a nasty feeling. Once you can know those feelings, the laughter and the anger. That means when a group of schoolgirls call you Mr. Bra, you don't get upset at all. You just laugh with them. Why give up a wonderful opportunity, you know, to, to laugh and feel this beautiful sense of not taking yourself so seriously and feeling almost immune, 
you know, from anybody who can say anything bad about you. Just the funny things, that's all. And I remember seeing that with Ajahn Chah, sometimes when people try to criticize him, that's all he would ever do. He would think it's so funny. When I did stupid things, I thought they were stupid things what I did. But whenever I did something stupid, he would just think it was so funny. Like, people reminded me of this because it was almost prescient that when I was a young monk, I needed some soap you know, to wash with. And so I went to see Ajahn Chah. That's where we got these things from. You know, Ajahn Chah got given all these requisites and he shared them with the, the monks who knew nobody. So I said I needed some soap. But Ajahn Chah could not speak English. Later on he could. He went to England. And we asked him afterwards, did you learn any English? He said, yes, one word, cup of tea. <laughs> that was the only word he, he learned. <laughs> but any, anyway, the word for soap is sabu. And I thought I'd learned the word properly, but I didn't say sabu, I said sapo. Close enough. But sapo meant pineapple. So Ajahn Chah, he asked me, what do you want pineapple for? To wash! <laughs> <laughs> and that was prescient because nowadays they actually do use pineapple as a soap. Somebody got this on the internet. It's a new way of making soap. So you see, I was much wiser than Ajahn <laughs> Chah thought. <laughs> but anyway, he never let me forget that. So he was, he was laughing with everybody. He said, these people from England, you know, they're far more advanced than we are in Thailand. They use soap. They use, we use soap. They use pineapple to wash in England. <laughs> but it made him laugh. He never got angry, upset, or thought we were stupid. Every mistake which I made was a, a cause for him to laugh, which is a beautiful thing. So that's for you. Every time your husband or wife does something really stupid, <laughs> laugh instead of getting angry. <laughs> that's a challenge for you. <laughs> you. You will find that it changes things. Just like there was an old story in Greek philosophy. Just shows you how wide these um, these talks uh, go. In Greek philosophy, uh, usually had one teacher would teach many disciples of many, many different parts of what life was about. And this one famous Greek philosopher you know, had a school and taught you know, the, the, te the students about you know, writing and reading and mathematics and astronomy and other stuff which is important in life. And whenever any of those students made a mistake and the teacher had to scold them and shout at them, you know, it's so stupid, you shouldn't have done that, blah, blah, blah. Whenever they, they had to shout at the student, the teacher charged them a few extra dollars. If anyone's been a teacher, that's very stressful, you know, shouting or scolding one of your stupid students. I think you know that. If you have a, a child at home and you have to scold them, that's extra stress for you. And if you are employed as a teacher, you should get some bonus to compensate you for all the shouting you have to do to your students. So that's what they used to do. And so anyway, when this student uh, graduated from the school and got a job, all his co-workers would always notice when anybody shouted at him for being stupid, he never ever got angry. Never once. Instead he laughed when he was scolded. When someone called him an idiot and stupid, he just burst out laughing. And then one day he said, why? Well, he said, you know, a couple of years ago when I was at school, I had to pay every time I was scolded now I, at work I get it for free. <laughs> That's why I laugh. 
it's just interpreting things in a totally different way, which means you can have more happiness and joy in your life. It's working on that emotional intelligence and part of your life. <coughs> this is something which I think many people forget to realize. The work which you do, and the way you do that work, and how you do that work. How many times do you laugh at work? Why not? Does laughter, smiling, cost any money? Why do we get angry? You know, sometimes people think, well, I have to get angry. If I don't get angry and scold somebody, then their misbehavior will continue. It does not work like that. How many times have people scolded you this last week? Told you off, shouted at you, or uh, embarrassed you in that way? What it really does, it stops a really will to help and to do things which are good. You find that people who, if you're running some sort of company, or at work somewhere, or even in a family, Getting angry and scolding other people just makes a separation between the people in that group or company. And that type of separation is very, very unworkable. Imagine a football team or a cricket team. And if that cricket team or football team, if they were shouting at one another in the same team, is that team going to get anywhere? when they're not working together. It's one of the reasons why, and I think Venerable Dayalu will sort of confirm this is actually how I run, if you say run Bodhinyana Monastery or the Buddhist Society of Western Australia. How many times do I criticize you? <coughs> Aurora, you work for the Buddhist Society. Madhu, you work for our Buddhist Society. How many times have I scolded you? How many times have I praised you? Quite a lot, I think. <laughs> and it's because of praise you encourage people. Imagine that. At work, you know, your boss actually praises you. Well done. You know, even though they're stretching the truth a little bit, but nevertheless, well done, amazing job. It's a very good job. A very good job I wasn't there to see you and get upset. <laughs> <laughs> whatever you say. <laughs> but when you actually praise people, what does it do to you? You really want to do more for this kind boss because people love praise. <clears throat> if you flattery, I was told this when I was a kid, flattery gets you nowhere. That's totally wrong. Flattery gets you everywhere. Try it out. Your kids. Uh, I saw a couple of kids today. We had lunch there. And sometimes, if your kids just get criticism all the time, even if they deserve it, what's the result? You will find the result is that they get negative, they don't want to be part of that family. And that's maybe an exaggeration, but it's certainly they have this feeling that they're not given space enough to grow. That's why praise does amazing things for people. Every time I'm praised for something, that sometimes I talk too much, I know that. If you sort of um, criticize me for talking too much, I'll say, no, that's not right. If you praise me for giving a short talk, that's much more effective. Because <laughs> people, <laughs> people like praise. It's what encourages you. It's what makes you sort of more want to do the right thing the next time. That's why a lot of time we make sure we praise people as much as possible. And that means you're encouraged, especially the kids at school. I used to be a school teacher for one year. That's where I lost all my hair. 
<laughs> That's an exaggeration. <laughs> but nevertheless, what happens in school? You know, this is you know, quite a few years ago. One of the things which happened in school, that you are tested. You have to have exams. And many of you have been through exams. How many of you have set exams? Because being a school teacher, you had to set the exams. I didn't like doing that. But not only that, at the end of the year, you have the final exams, you know, for the end of the year. And one of the children in my class, when I gave out the results, one of the children came bottom. 30th in the class of 30. Of course, somebody has to come bottom of the class. Even if the whole 30 kids were sort of Albert Einstein level, one of them has to become the worst Albert Einstein in the class. So this kid, it was a boy this year, came bottom of the class. Have you ever come bottom of the class in something? How does it feel? It feels awful, terrible, like you don't belong, like there's something wrong with you. You're stigmatized, you're stupid. So what happened was as soon as I gave out the results, this boy, you know, his shoulders drooped, his head went down, and he didn't keep eye contact with me. He was looking at his desk. You can see he was getting depressed. I could not allow that. So I went up to him by his desk, and I told him, at that time they all knew I was a, a Buddhist. I even taught a week of meditation in the school assembly. You know, this was 1973. So this was teaching meditation at school. That was you know, almost 60 years ago, no, no 50 years ago. So you know, they all knew I was a Buddhist. So I said to him, look, um, I've come to t talk to you about the idea of a bodhisattva. It's a Buddhist Mahayana idea. A bodhisattva is someone who willingly, deliberately sacrifices her own happiness for the sake of others. They're not caring about themselves, they're caring about other people. He said, that's praised a lot in Mahayana Buddhism. And I said, I really think that's what you have done this year. You've deliberately, on purpose, taken the bottom position at school so that your friends and colleagues don't have to suffer what you're going to get from your parents tonight. <laughs> You've done it on purpose, haven't you? And I said, I know you can do much better, but nevertheless, I think it's a wonderful thing you've done, willingly taking the bottom place at school so that no one else has to. Congratulations, I'm going to go to the principal's office right away and I'm going to nominate you for Bodhisattva of the Year Award in this school. <laughs> and he looked at me as if I was the stupidest teacher he'd ever had in his life. <laughs> but at least, <laughs> at least it took him out of his depression. <laughs> you know, and, and I did say the most important thing is that with bodhisattvas, you're only allowed to be a bodhisattva once in school. Next year, let someone else take the bottom, <laughs> the bottom position. <laughs> in other words, I was looking at that position, that experience of being bottom of the class in a totally different way. With emotional intelligence was something which most people say is stupid. But it was more than just, you know, just being stupid. Teaching a kid how to look at what he thought as failure in a totally different light. Not being a personal failing, but just a temporary thing. And to this day, and I often mention, there's no such thing as a person who's a failure. There's people who fail sometimes. There's no such thing as a person who's stupid. There's people who are stupid sometimes, but not all the time. There's never a person who's angry. There's a person who's angry sometimes, who loses it sometimes. Other times they're amazing beings. Even to the point 
that there's never a person who's schizophrenic. There's people who are schizophrenic sometimes. And I'm not just saying that. That was a quote I got from the head of the schizophrenic unit in Singapore's Woodlands Hospital for Mental Disease. I went to give a presentation at a conference on mental illness in Singapore. And when I gave my presentation afterwards, this professor, he was not even a Buddhist, he was a Catholic, and he said, wonderful presentation Ajahn Brahm, I'd like to invite you to our center for schizophrenia to bless my, my unit. And straight away I looked at him, there's a big cross on his chest. And I said, but you're a Catholic, you want a Buddhist monk to bless your unit? Why? And he said, because what you just said, I totally agree with. And that's why I want to invite you to bless my ward. I said, well, what ward is it? That's where he announced he was the head of schizophrenia, the professor, the psychiatrist in charge of that in Singapore. And I said, well, how do you treat schizophrenia? Exactly the way you said. He told me, I do not treat schizophrenia. Even though he was a professor of schizophrenia. I treat the other part of the patient who's not schizophrenic. I got what he meant straight away. And I did something a Buddhist monk is not supposed to do. Put their hands up to do an act of like worship. Your wisdom, brilliance. Because if we treat the schizophrenia, that grows. If you treat the anger, husband, you shouldn't be so angry. Wife, you shouldn't be just so emotional, or whatever it is you say. No, don't mention or don't focus on the things which are causing problems in your relationship. Focus on the things which aren't causing the problems. The beautiful stuff, the stuff you admire. <laughs> don't focus on the behavior which is uh, socially uh, difficult with a kid who has, say, schizophrenia or who is autistic or who is whatever. Focus on the times and the behavior which are socially easy for you to be with. Because what you focus on, you're actually encouraging. You are actually developing that. What you focus on is that that's important to you. So when you focus on the positive stuff, the positive stuff grows. That's why I asked him, he said, when you don't treat the schizophrenia in these patients, you treat the other part, and what's the results? And I knew his answer. He said, much better than standard results or standard treats, treatments. Don't work for everybody, but they just do a much better job. And I think you can understand why. Because sometimes when you acknowledge the good behavior, the kind behavior, the wonderful behavior, whatever you think it is, you'll find that that actually grows in a person. That becomes stronger. That's also one of the reasons why I'm also a meditation teacher, when people talk about their meditation. A lot of the times they talk about the problems in their meditation. Sometimes I say, well, let's just put those aside for a while. What about the good meditations? Why did you have peace? Why did you have joy? Why did you have this wonderful sense of freedom? Why? The reason I say that is because I want them to focus and to remember, to see the beautiful stuff. Sometimes people get negative about life. There's so much negativity about, I don't know the world these days. But there's so many beautiful things happening in this world. You know, just, I think it was this, this morning, or I think it was yesterday morning, 
just see the dawn come up in serpentine. It's gorgeous. It's beautiful. And that's there for everybody for free. You don't have to pay for that. You don't have to buy a ticket to enter, you know, the vision of dawn early in the morning. <laughs> it's there all the time. There's so much beauty around. And the kindness which people have, which each one of you, the laughter which we can share, that's gorgeous stuff. So when I focus on that and ask you to focus on it as well, you find that actually it's seeing a part of life which sometimes we neglect, we take for granted. Problems is what we focus on way too much. If you focus on the problems, trying to think that if I focus long enough on the problem I can fix it, you forget there's more to life than the problems. What it really is, is that story I told so many years ago, which many of you have heard so many times, the two bad bricks in the wall. Why did I just focus on two bad bricks in the wall which I laid for about three months? Could have been six months, I think it was maybe three, it doesn't matter the time. And I wanted to destroy the wall. I just could not see the beautiful bricks in the wall. That's like when you watch the news. You see all the problems in the world. How about the, the beautiful stuff which is happening in this world? Which is huge. Then you find that a lot of the stuff which you worry about, it's just the two faults. The things which we feel that a person is schizophrenic, OCDC. I actually got it right today. I, did I? I usually say ACDC. <laughs> I usually do, I don't know why. <laughs> anyway, the problems in this world. Imagine that you were some of the sickness, and mental sickness, and you know, your friends, people who really cared about you say, I wouldn't have you any other way in the world. Exactly as you are is, is beautiful enough for me. And you meant it. What would that do? That stress of being rejected, the stress of not being good enough, the feeling that you don't belong, the feeling there's something wrong with you which can never be fixed. Have you ever felt like that? Being discriminated against, not accepted, stigmatized? It's a terrible thing. So imagine the result of that. And imagine like that doctor in Singapore treating the other part of the patient. That is letting them see that they are valuable, valuable human beings. They are welcome. Welcome in this world, no matter who you are. Too many kids feel that they are rejected, not good enough. So they try so hard, but still they're rejected. How does that feel? What type of society are we building? And imagine when you actually are welcomed. You feel good about yourself. Even though you can make mistakes, you're just a bodhisattva. Well done. So that's one of the things that emotional intelligence We've got all sorts of crazy monks at Bodhinyana. <laughs> <laughs> but they're all welcome. That's one of the reasons why if you go to Bodhinyana monastery and just looking for every monk being totally enlightened, <laughs> you'd be disappointed. <laughs> Instead you see, Beautiful human beings have got a wonderful place where they can live. And they'll be very friendly, each in their own ways, because they feel they're accepted. Then they can accept you as the visitors. So anyway, uh, that's a little talk tonight, just on the emotional intelligence of not just teaching facts. What are facts anyway? People argue over facts. But of the emotional intelligence of acceptance, respect, 
peace and just being with things instead of trying to change them all the time. Anyway, that's the talk for tonight. So any questions, comments or complaints? The three C's. Okay, yes. The ones at Q, you yes, say. The goal of life. Yeah. When you understand what you about goals in life. So your goal of your life is to have no goal to achieve. Let go of yeah. Sometimes like the goals in life. Why do we need goals? Goals means that you know want to get something else, somewhere else, go somewhere else. A goal in life that means you're not really happy enough where you are. And my question is that um, being nine to five average worker, how we do the practice to reach the goal you want to reach? Yeah, easy. Just again, have no goals. <laughs> And then you've reached everything. It's just so simple. Whatever goal you have, when you reach it, it's not quite enough and you want something more. And when you reach that goal, you want something more. Okay, this little story I wrote a long time ago. I noticed this when I was at university. Because over in UK, you know, you had to, first of all, the first big exams you did were the O-levels. That was done uh, usually about 16. I did my O levels when I was 14. And so I worked really hard for those O levels. Because my friends and my family and teachers said, if you pass your O levels, then you'll be able to get good jobs in life and get enough money. You'll be happy. At that time, I liked playing football, soccer in the park. And I was pretty good. You know, I'd, I could have been a millionaire by now if I'd have carried on playing soccer instead of going to school. <laughs> have you seen how much these soccer players get? Anyway, I gave up soccer and just studied. And I did very well in my old levels. Was I happy? No, because I had to do more exams, A-levels. But A-levels were important. You do well at A-levels, you can go to university, you can be really happy. So I... At that time, as I say, I wasn't chasing footballs then, I was chasing girls. <laughs> and so, you know, my family and friends said, look, stop going out so much. Just, you know, just stay at home, do your studies, get your A-levels, and then you'll be happy. I, I believed them. You trusted others. So I did my A-levels, did really well. And so I went to university. <laughs> And had a big university, Cambridge. I mean, that's a really big university. They said, wow, get your degree from Cambridge and then you'll be happy. And that's when I started getting suspicious. Because <laughs> <laughs> I saw other people who had got degrees. Were they happy? No. They had to do more work. Either get an MA or a PhD or something. Or if they didn't do that, they got a job. Were they happy getting a job when you got a degree? No way. They never got enough money and you had to save up for a car, save up for a place to live. And at that time, you were trying to get just, you know, transport and a place to stay and also, you know, just trying to get a wife in life if you were a guy. And that was really a lot of, a lot of trouble. I always thought, yeah, once you get a nice wife, why, why do men go to so much trouble getting them? They don't believe it's going to make them happy. So I thought, once I get a nice wife and save up to have enough money, a nice house and a car, then I'll be happy. But I did some research. I was smart enough then to know some people who were older. And then what happens? Were they happy? No way. Because once you got married, and that was really expensive, you know, you did in a bigger house and then you had to have mortgages and have to work hard to pay off the mortgages. You never pay it off because, you know, after four or five years of marriage, you have kids and that's really expensive. And many people kept telling me that oh, once the kids grow up and leave home, then I can be happy. And then what happens is by that time, most people are close to retirement 
And they kept saying, oh, when I retire, then I'll be happy. I don't have to go to work every morning, not so much stress. And then when they retire, are they happy? No. That's when I noticed that most of the people who went to, especially Christian churches, were people who were really old. There's quite a few of them here too. <laughs> <laughs> you know why? Because they think if you go to a church or a mosque or a, a temple, then when you die, then you'll be happy. <laughs> Those were the goals in life. O levels, A levels, getting enough money, going to university, getting a goal, find your soulmate in life. And then when you do, are you happy? Now be honest. <laughs> and sometimes that's why, as a monk, you thought this is a wonderful life. No goals. It's like you've already arrived. All your goals have been met. You've arrived, baby. You've arrived. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I used to say <laughs> in the old days. You're at peace at last. Real retirement. So you can really enjoy your life. You don't need anything, want anything. So I know a lot of people, they work hard in their life, they have their material goals. Sometimes have compassionate goals to solve diseases, which is wonderful. But then in the end, all the diseases which get solved, people will die anyway. So what is your goal? Not to cure diseases, but to care for people. To care for oneself too. You're a person as well. Okay. Uh, <laughs> of course, Eddie. You have to. It's tradition. <laughs> Ajahn Brahm, this is not challenging you, okay? Not, yeah, in a friendly way, yeah. Okay. You are saying I'm in about trouble. the peace in the, peace in the world, no? respecting one and one. Uh, one, what, you know, respect each other and all these things, good, okay? And then you're talking about the good things happening in, like, in the morning, in the, yeah. What, all, yeah. And the two bad bricks, you no. Know. Don't you think what is happening now in the world we live in now, you know, okay? With the, the war, one, wars after wars going on, you know. Now you have the currency war and all things. They're trying, threatening to use nuclear, you know. This is more than the two bad bricks in the wall. In the wall, you know. it's a serious matter. You know. Any time it can trigger a world war, you know. yeah, and then we human. The, the thing is, what are we? The, that's from the top. You know. if we if we can't, these are from the minds of the top. Okay, if the, we, how do I say? If they can't solve, the, if they continue doing all these things, okay, okay, yeah. It, it, now, what I mean is maybe. Uh, if there's no solution, maybe us, you know, the mess of the world, we should all unite together and tell them, you know, the top people, we don't want a war, we want peace. Indeed, I mean, most people do want peace, and it's just a few people, you know, who just get a bit crazy with power. You know, power is only what people give you. You don't have inherent power. And so a lot of times that many of these people, you know, you're talking about, that after a while they lose their power. And a bit of sanity comes in for a while. Sometimes there's a scary situation is where we learn. But you know that to think that there's going to be a nuclear war, great devastation on this planet, I don't think that's a possibility. The reason I don't think that's a possibility. It only takes a madman four minutes to press the button and jump But around. that button has to. You shoot to me, I shoot you, that's how it is. Button has to be there to begin with. And pressing buttons and stuff like that, it's not that simple. And I m remember just, there were actually movies. When I first came to Perth, many people thought there was going to be a nuclear war between. Um, 
I think was it President Reagan and um, the Soviet Union at the time. And there were movies about it and we were told to watch them. At that time, my predecessor, Ajahn Chakaro, he made sure that every morning, there's only two monks at that time, we had to drink miso soup. You know why? Because apparently miso soup makes you a little bit more tolerant to nuclear radiation. <laughs> <laughs> it was actually quite nice, but nevertheless. <laughs> That's what we drank it for. And it never happened. There was many bunkers built at huge expense which were never used. So that fear came in years ago, but it never happened. And these things which happen today, people think, oh, this is different. It's not, it's the same. Have a bit of confidence and faith in human beings that it will not allow this to happen. If I'm wrong, and this is a nuclear war, you won't be able to criticize me because I'll be gone <laughs> too. <laughs> no, I'm not criticizing, I just quickly, I jump up. Also the press too, you know. Yeah. They're supposed to be the press portraying neutrality, you know. Yeah. It's all propaganda, lies, all these things. It comes to the point where I find not only me, a lot of people, they don't even watch the news now, these things. Yeah, instead of watching the news, you should watch the BSWA <laughs> podcast. <laughs> Okay, anyway, the question from overseas. From Kuala Lumpur. What's the real meaning of non-attachment? Does it mean we let go of anything that we really want in life? Non-attachment means you don't own things. So you can still do good things in life. So, what you really want in life, if you do get it, you share it. It's not just for you, it's for all of us from Germany. Could you explain the difference between steps 7, 8 and 8 of the Eightfold Path? Can you explain meditation and samadhi in a nutshell so even children can understand it? Goodness gracious, that's a deep question. But nevertheless, uh, so children can understand it. The seventh factor is like awareness, mindfulness. And it's not just awareness, it's to understand just how these things come and go. Not just that they do come and go, that how, why they come and go, what the causes are. And that gives you more opportunity to not to, to own them. Not to own your body, not to own the things which come up and go away in your mind. Which means when you let them go, you can be far more still. It's that stillness is what happens, what is the eighth factor of the Eightfold Path. To be able to get the jhanas, which are the eighth factor of the Eightfold Path, there's no sort of argument about what those uh, experiences are. You need to let go a lot. It's not you doing something. It's not you striving for these things. It's when you totally let go. And a good example of that is that story of the little novice in the time of Ajahn Chah. Ajahn Chah was giving an extremely boring sermon, which went on and on and on and on and on, and on and on and on and on. And, and then this little novice thought, when is Ajahn Chah going to stop? When is he going to stop? When is he going to stop? And that became just repeated in his mind over and over and over. And then this novice, about maybe nine or ten years of age or something, then he turned it around. When am I going to stop? And that little novice stopped. First time he got into a very deep meditation. Blissed out for a few hours. And when he opened his eyes, it was dawn. He'd been meditating in the hall for hours. That's where the mindfulness, you now when am I going to stop? And the wisdom which comes up from that causes his mind to stop and bliss out. These deep meditations, they are more profound and easy than anyone thinks. From Hong Kong. Dear Ajahn, how do you laugh if you're angry or upset against your better judgment of being scolded? Thank you. Happy 40 years for your kindness. If you're angry and upset, why do you get angry and upset to begin with? It means you're allowing the world to control you. They've stolen your happiness. 
It's one of the reasons whenever there's a burglary, a few years ago there was a burglary at Bodhinyana Monastery, and I said to them, look, the burglars can steal the tools from the tool shed, but please don't let them steal your happiness. Don't get angry. And it worked. Because when we actually got the insurance payout, the insurance payment, we could replace every tool which was stolen, but an upgrade, a much better quality of tools. <laughs> so, you know, we actually gave loving kindness to the burglar. Please come again anytime. <laughs> <laughs> From Germany again. Dear Ajahn, is sila meaning knowing what is wholesome, what is unwholesome, a natural biological thing that isn't made up of concepts, learning, identity, and self, or is it dependent? It is a naturally occurring thing. And I remember what really convinced me of that was of this, I don't know, in the Vietnam War, there was one atrocity called the My Lai Massacre. Uh, it was, I think, it was Captain or Colonel, Lieutenant Kelly, I think it was Kelly, who actually just led his troops into the village of My Lai to kill, murder every man, woman or child without any discrimination. And it's one of the soldiers, it was a great tragedy, not just a tragedy, an atrocity. And anyway, that one of the soldiers refused. He was a black African soldier. And he said, no, I'm not going in. And he refused and was sent to jail because of that. Military jail, which is tough. He knew what he was up for, but he said, I just can't do that. Other ones could, they did. But in this documentary, he was one of the only members of that sort of uh, group of uh, American soldiers who was basically happy with his life. His virtue had given him that sense of integrity, honesty, and goodness. He was a good man and a happy man. And when they asked, how could you do that? You know, what you was like devout Christian or something, or you philosopher? He said, no, no, I was just born in the ghettos. I didn't have any religion. But then he could actually feel the, the virtue that this was not a thing he could do. He didn't work it out. He just felt his heart and said, how can you sort of shoot M16s at little kids or young ladies or even men? So it's true. A lot of the virtue comes from inside. Eh? Too many. How can we deal with bigoted and disrespectful family members when forced to be around them? Forced to be around them? One thing you can use these days is because a lot of times people in the family, they have these little iPods and they put earbuds in their ears. <laughs> so you don't have to listen to them. <laughs> hmm. Anyway. Uh, bigoted and disrespectful family members, sometimes Whenever they say something which is not bigoted, some things which are respectful, praise them for that. Say, thank you, that's a nice thing you said. So you're reinforcing positive comments from them. Last question. If we have to keep accepting all the mistakes of our close ones, how will they become better? You don't accept all the mistakes. You focus on the good things which they do. The mistakes you to kind of ignore but then the beautiful things which people do, you really praise them for that. Thank you so much for what you did. I was so grateful. And just really overgo, overdo the praise. And you find that people love being praised. So anyway, I did those last questions very quickly because I've got to, okay, another question. Okay, last question. Um, my question is like, when and how should you meditate? Like, you should take a shower, wear new clothes and meditate, and should it, can it be any part of the day, and how you should not meditate? Easy. The best time to meditate is now. The worst time to meditate is later on. You don't need to shower. You don't need to do anything. Just if you feel like meditating, just close your eyes and do it. Otherwise you'll find all the excuses of why not to meditate. My clothes are dirty, it's too hot, it's too cold, I'm too tired, it's too noisy. It's too so now is always the best time to meditate. And the worst time is always later on. Okay, so thank you all for listening. And 
When's the best time to finish the talk? Always now. <laughs> Never later on. So I'm now going to bow three times. Patipano Bhagavato Sawaka Sango